Back to our Mike Lowe at the uh, courthouse with more on his observations. Any idea, Mike, if Ed Burke or one of his surrogates, the legal team, is going to speak or at least put out a statement? Uh, we don't know what will happen yet. Uh, we believe that Ed Burke and his legal team are on the 17th floor. The courtroom is on the 25th floor. Then they go to kind of gather their things and, and discuss uh, on the 17th floor. We believe that's where they are right now. Uh, I think it would be likely that we will hear from his attorneys. Not so certain that we will hear from Ed Burke himself. Uh, the reaction that I saw in the courtroom, uh, his face seemed to turn bright red when the verdict was read, especially when the first guilty uh, was announced. Uh, after this was all over, his wife Anne gave him a kiss and a hug and patted him on the back a couple of times. Um, so no doubt they're dealing with the consequences of what uh, this might mean um, right now and, and trying to figure out what their next steps are. Uh, he could be facing a prison sentence uh, for the rest of his life. Just one of the counts of racketeering uh, carries with it a 20-year sentence uh, if that were to be handed down uh, at sentencing. So there's certainly, I'm sure, a lot of emotions that they're dealing with right now, uh, trying to sort through what this all means. But I do think it would be likely that we would hear from his attorneys at some point this afternoon. Mike, let me ask you about the one winner in that courtroom today, and that was Burke's co-defendant, Peter Andrews, his longtime aide. Uh, you sat in that trial every single day. What was different about what Andrews was accused of doing versus what Burke was accused of doing? Because Andrews is walking out of there a free man. Well, you know, it was, it's interesting. Uh, Peter Andrews is an interesting case. He was described by prosecutors as a Burke's right-hand man. Uh, he was called Burke's chief of staff at points during the testimony. But uh, the, uh, his lawyers <laughs> tried to paint a completely different picture of somebody who was kind of just there. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with any of the decision-making. Uh, to the jury, they described him as lunch pail Pete. Um, part-time Pete, uh, somebody that really didn't have anything to do with any of the big decisions. Uh, and even to the point of presenting evidence, a photo of Ed Burke meeting at this Burger King that he was uh, allegedly trying to shake down. I can say now he was convicted of shaking down the owners of this Burger King. Um, they even showed a photo uh, that was taken of Pete Andrews in cargo shorts and a t-shirt. And then, of course, Ed Burke, Natalie, dressed in his uh, trademark pinstripe suit. So they tried to paint the picture just by what he was wearing, uh, that he was not kind of a key player in all of this. And clearly the jury agreed. Mike, I want to take a moment as we wait to hear from uh, some of the attorneys in this case, just to kind of go through some of the different schemes that were highlighted during this trial. You covered this for all six weeks. You heard the, what, three dozen witnesses who came up. Um, out of all the things that you heard, what were some of the things that struck you the most? Let's start with perhaps that whole idea of uh, did we land the tuna, right? That's what people have heard the most about. Yeah, that was uh, concerning the so-called scheme to shake down the developers of the old main post office, uh, Harry Skydell and the 601 West Group, these developers from New York that were coming in to take over this iconic property and kind of bring it back to life. Um, that was a recording made secretly by the former alderman, Danny Solis, uh, of the 25th Ward, in which the old main post office sits. Uh, that was a, a secret recording made at a meeting with Ed Burke, and it kind of became one of those infamous lines in Chicago political history. Ed Burke referring to the business of uh, Harry Skydell and the 601 West Group, asking, did we land the tuna? Did we get the business for Clafter and Burke, my private law firm? Um, so that's one of the lines that I think will stick with people. I think people seeing Ed Burke go like this and smile on, on camera saying uh, the cash register hasn't rung yet will be one. Um, I think the, the idea of Danny Solis making his first appearance uh, in five years, uh, this figure who not only has now brought down Ed Burke, but may in a few months bring down Michael Madigan, the longtime Speaker of the House. Many of the recordings made by uh, Danny Solis will be used in that trial as well. So very interesting to see him. That was certainly one of the highlights of the trial, certainly the highlights of the testimony. But if you go all the way back to the first day of testimony when um, 
Professor Mixon from Elmhurst University spoke, she talked about a lot of the ideas that you were just speaking about with David Greising and the idea of um, the many mayors and the fiefdoms and the power that can be accumulated by an alderman in this city with aldermanic prerogative. Uh, and in that sense, this is a win for a phrase that came up in uh, Professor Mixon's testimony, the idea of I don't want to talk to nobody that nobody no, sent. sent. Well, this is a win for the people who don't have the clout, the people that aren't connected, um, that don't have an avenue to Ed Burke or, or another really well-connected alderman. So I think that's how good government people will view these results here today, this uh, this verdict in this in this case. Mike, you've been sitting in on this trial from uh, day one, and you obviously reported on it before when the charges came down, and et cetera. Was there any time when you said to yourself, okay, I think they got this guy, they got these guys? Or were you still kind of unsure going into last night? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think to the average Joe Grabowski on the streets of Chicago, they'd say, okay, uh, what do we think actually happened here? And if you read the stories, you're like, well, wait, so they never actually hired his law firm? He was never paid by any of these people? And the permits eventually did get issued, and the, uh, the you know, construction did get done, and he never got his goddaughter the internship, and on and on and on. Uh, people had this sense of, well, this is an extortion case without extortion. That's what his lawyers were trying to argue. But as you heard the uh, assistant U.S. attorney, Diane MacArthur, methodically go through the charges, uh, especially when you're talking about attempted extortion and making clear to the jurors that the act does not have to be accomplished for it to be a crime in the same way that if you were to walk into a bank with a gun and try to rob it, but you don't leave with any money, that's still attempted robbery. Uh, that's the kind of idea that they try to uh, impress upon the jurors here that the crimes were in the act, the uh, the using his power and influence to try and twist the arms uh, and, and this kind of constant hunt for business for his own law firm. It's easy to lose sight of the transformational change that has occurred in both Chicago and state politics in the last year or so. Uh, and we don't blame you viewers at home for not living this every single day in the same way we might. But you have two corruption cases, one involving Ed Burke, one involving former Illinois House Speaker Mike Madigan, uh, that even before they went to trial, basically removed the clot that had been in the bloodstream of politics uh, Burke, in this uh, state for a long right now, time. Um, if you can see him right there. We can see him. Uh, ben, if you can see, there he is. That's his wife, the former uh, Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court. Ann uh, Burke. On, on his arm We there. saw, uh, heard reporters shouting questions and uh, stoic as he was, walking away with his wife, uh, probably, I would say, easily, fair to say, mm -hmm. stunned yeah. about what has transpired this afternoon. I would think on some level you uh, prepare yourself for that. Uh, Mike, since you were in the courtroom for those six weeks, was there any point when you, you know, you, you got to see his face when some of this testimony was made, when some of these videos were played? Was there any point where you thought, oh, this is somebody who feels any kind of remorse? This is somebody who is wondering what's going to happen with the rest of his life? Anything like that that you can paint a picture for us as to his demeanor? He never portrayed anything like remorse. Uh, the most animated he got, uh, he would occasionally crack a smile or even laugh when certain things were brought up, like when it was mentioned by one of his attorneys that they uh, that he would give out uh, copies of his book. Uh, inside the wigwam, which is about uh, presidential nominating conventions in Illinois. He would always get a little chuckle about that. Sometimes they would talk about jokes that Ed Burke would tell, and he would smile and, and laugh about that. There was even a point where they talked about how he still used an America Online, an AOL email address, and his, uh, his attorney called him a dinosaur, and Ed Burke smiled at that. But for basically the rest of the trial, he sat there stone-faced, uh, not reacting to anything, not reacting to the 
the tuna call, not reacting to the cash register hasn't rung call, uh, not even really reacting to when Danny Solis came face to face, sat there with his arms crossed. Uh, a lot of times he was taking notes. Uh, he's an attorney himself, of course. Um, he would pass notes to his attorneys. But during the trial, really not much emotion. Um, and certainly he didn't talk to reporters throughout this whole uh, six or seven weeks that he's been coming to the Dirksen Federal Building. Um, so we haven't gotten to ask him what he was thinking, but just from what we could tell from his facial expressions at certain points, it was pretty stone-faced, almost a scowl at times. Uh, but as I said, there were times uh, where he did crack a smile or, you know, there were some moments of levity, obviously, throughout the six weeks. All right, Mike, we're going to let you go for now. Other things to be done there at the courthouse.